we care a lot about security in our apps, as you might imagine. Um, so I was trying to think about security and apps. I'm trying to think about how somebody could be trying to attack my app. So I wanted to think, I wanted to flip that around a little bit and think as the attacker. So I started, um, I started by decompiling other people's apps. So when you take an app, you, you bundle it up, you, you're, am I too loud? I feel very loud. Okay. Um, your code gets compiled, your resources, all that gets bundled up into an APK. You push that to the Play Store. I download that to my phone, right? We're, if you've shipped an app, you, you know this process. Um, but once I've got your APK on my phone, I can use ADB to figure out where the APK went. So I use that command, and then I can use another command to pull it onto my laptop. It just copies that APK. And then I can unzip it. An APK is a, just a zip file. Inside is a file called classes.dex. That's your code, compiled bytecode. Um, but it's Dalvik bytecode, which I don't read. So I'm going to decompile that. Um, there's a bunch of tools available for this decompiling. On the slide, I've got a couple of uh, open source tools that'll go Dalvik bytecode to Java bytecode and Java bytecode to Java source code. There are other tools. Um, but after all that, you end up with something that looks kind of like this. It resembles your source code. It's not exactly your source code. Um, your comments are gone. Um, there's been some optimizations. You see these really long integer values. Those are like um, your r.id values. Uh, parameter, parameter names are lost in the method. Um, inner classes get pulled out. So it's not exactly your code, but functionally, this works the same as your code, and if I'm trying to reverse engineer your app, I'm going to use this to figure out what it's doing. Um, because hopefully you, when you were writing your code, you did a good job of naming things, right? Naming things is hard, so we spend a lot of time naming things, and we give it meaningful names so that our colleagues don't yell at us. But then I can use those meaningful names when I'm reverse engineering your app to figure out how it's working. So what you would rather, well, not just figure out how it's working, but somebody's gonna, I'm a, I'm a nice person, so I'm just doing this for fun, but there are bad people out there. Um, so they're looking for like your license verification codes, so they can disable that, make a cracked version of your app. Um, they're looking for your special sauce algorithm, whatever it is, copy it out, pull it into their app. Um, or one thing I like to do is figure out how your app is talking to your server, so I can look through your networking stack, figure out you know, how you're handling authentication, how you're passing values. Um, to try to find some way to uh, find a vulnerability there. So what you would rather for me or anybody else to see when they decompile your app is something lo that looks like this. So this is code that was obfuscated with ProGuard and then decompiled. Um, this is code out of an app of mine, but I can't tell you what this code does because I don't know what class C is or what the C.E interface is supposed to be. Um, so this is, what, this is what you want me to see, and this is actually what I expected to see because I, I figured most people were using ProGuard. It's in, it's in the docs, right? So we're all, we're all doing exactly what the docs tell us to do. Um, but what I found is that you know, I pulled a couple apps off my phone, I started decompiling them, and I found that the code, for the most part, um, wasn't being obfuscated. And so you know, I looked at one app, two app, and I wanted to, I wanted to get something a little more systematic. So I took all of the, phone, the apps on my phone, um, there's 200 some apps, pulled them all off, and ran a script that just sort of gave each one a score from zero to 100 for how much of the code was, was obfuscated. Um, and this is, this is the results. I expected, so I expected this kind of bimodal distribution, so there'd be a big lump down at zero, right? The apps that aren't using ProGuard, no code is obfuscated. And then I expected another lump up towards 100, so if you're using ProGuard, most of your code should be obfuscated. Um, and you can see I didn't really get that. I got half of the apps down in that down, down near zero range, um, but then the other half of the apps had this big spread from 25 to 75%. Like, why is it that you can run ProGuard and one app is going to get a quarter of its code obfuscated and another app is going to get three quarters obfuscated? Um, so then I remembered every time that I've had a problem with ProGuard, and you get, a, you get an error message like at, at runtime or at build time, and you search for it and you end up on Stack Overflow or a GitHub issue, and uh, you know, somebody says, oh, I have this problem. You're like, good, I have that problem. And then you get a couple more comments, me too. And then you get this guy who comes along and says, don't worry about it, we can solve this problem. You just add this stuff to your ProGuard config. And everybody says yes, right? You get some thumbs up, so everybody's like, good, I have solved this problem. My error went away. 
you do notice that this guy got some thumbs down because Jake Wharton came along and said, don't do that. Uh, because in this case, and we'll go into the details in a little bit more, but basically these rules say, um, ProGuard, you can't obfuscate all of the code in this library. And so, okay, I had an error in my networking stack, so I added these rules for OKHTTP. Okay, well, then I got another error in my animations library, so I added some more rules there, and then another error in, you know, on and on and on for all these libraries, and all of a sudden you, you work your way to the left of this graph. More and more of your code is unobfuscated. So the goal of this talk is to make you more like, more like Jake Wharton, um, to help you write better ProGuard rules by understanding how it works. That's loud. Uh, so ProGuard is a, it's a bytecode transformation tool, so it takes Java bytecode, runs some transformations, writes out Java bytecode. It does shrinking, which is finding unused code and removing it. It does obfuscation, which is the example I kind of started with, where you take those meaningful names that you've worked so hard to give. The JVM or the whatever virtual machine doesn't need to see those. You can just replace them with names like A, B, C. And it does uh, bytecode optimization. Um, I'm not gonna talk much about bytecode optimization. Um, the talk was kind of already at the limits. Uh, and it's also a topic I don't know as well. And it's not where people tend to get caught up from what I've seen. People get caught up with the first two. So if you wanna learn more about optimization, um, there is a talk from DroidCon UK, sinking your teeth into bytecode. Um, it's Jake Wharton, he goes into he goes into a lot of de detail about bytecode, but one of the examples he gives is walking through a bytecode optimization that ProGuard can run on your code. Um, so yeah, not gonna talk about optimization, but we're gonna talk about shrinking and obfuscation. So the first thing that ProGuard does when it runs is it loads in some config. Um, so you're used to, like any command line app, you give it switches for dash do this, dash don't do that, dash verbose. Um, with ProGuard, we're gonna give it a lot of these, so we put them in a text file, you know, we don't assign them all on the command line. Um, so, you know, the, the first couple are sort of modes like I talked about, and then the rest of those are all dash keep something. Keep rules are how you tell ProGuard about code that it needs to keep, entry points into your code. We're gonna get into those uh, in a little more detail later, but those are part of the config that you, that you feed in. So then ProGuard needs to load in your code, right? That's what it's gonna transform. So it loads in uh, your code. Uh, it's already been compiled at this point into Java bytecode. So you, you started with Java or Kotlin. ProGuard doesn't really care. Um, it also loads in any libraries that you're shipping with your app. So this is all of the, the bytecode that you're gonna ship in your app. And ProGuard, again, doesn't care about the difference between my code versus OKHDDP OK or whatever other library I'm including. So all that together is the program class pool. This is what ProGuard is going to, to act on. It's going to transform this code. It also needs to know about the, um, what it calls the library class pool. This is the, the framework APIs, right? Um, you're gonna call these. It needs to be able to understand those, those references, the, the integrity of that code, but it can't transform that code, so it has to keep it in a separate, a separate pool. Okay, so the next thing those keep rules, I don't know if you, if you remember, there's lots of uh, stars and sort of wild cards. So you typically don't define exactly every class and every function that you need to keep. You make sort of rules that are gonna get pattern matched. So once it's loaded in the rules, it's loaded in your code, it finds the places in your code that match the rules. Um, and I said those are entry points into your code. We'll see what you're doing after you get through the entry point in a second, but it writes out the matches as seeds.txt, it writes out several of these text files while it's running that you can use for debugging. Um, so once we've got those entry points, we can start to do shrinking. It can, it can start to transform your code at this point. So we wanna remove the unused code, so it does, it starts by figuring out the opposite, right? Find the code that is used. So we start at those entry points, and ProGuard understands sort of Java code references. So we're starting at this onCreate method, we know that it references um, that field, and then it calls this string util class, it calls this function in the class, that function references this other field, and we've walked all the way through, right? We've walked as far through the code as we can at that point. 
So everything else is unused code. I mean, anything that we didn't get to as we were walking through the code from the entry points is unused. And we can remove it. And so ProGuard writes out the code that it removed to this uh, usage.txt file. This is usage.txt is the unused code. Um, so now we've removed the unused code. Now we can rename what's left. So again, with those entry points, we're not going to be able to rename those because something else is going to be calling into that code. Um, so but we can rename everything else. So ProGuard figures out the mapping of, OK, for each class, each function, each field, here's the original name. Here's what I'm going to change the name to. And then it goes through, changes the names of the uh, declarations there. Um, then you got to update the references as well so that they match. And there you go. You have valid code again. This runs. The entry points are still there. They still have the names, so they can still be referenced. Um, but everything inside, the names have changed. We don't know what that code's doing anymore. Well, we as humans can't read it anymore. The virtual machine can read it just fine. Um, so at this point, we're going to take a little digression from uh, what ProGuard is doing to, to see what happens when you, when you uh, ship code like this. Because if you get a, when you ship code like this and you get a, a crash in it, which happens to me sometimes, um, you will get a stack trace. And it looks something like this. You get, uh, you know, you're used to seeing a stack trace, frame, 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 this function calling that one. Um, but this is really hard to debug because these aren't your function names. They're not your class names, right? They got renamed. Uh, what you want to see is something like this your original names so that you can go look up those functions and see what you did wrong. So this is the obfuscation process that ran. It wrote out that mapping file. We can use the mapping file to reverse it, um, to take an obfuscated stack trace and de-obfuscate it. You can do this by hand, by just by looking up you know, the thing that you need in the mapping. Uh, that can get tedious if you're doing more than like one or two frames. So there's a couple of tools available. Um, there is a a shell script that ships with ProGuard. So in the Android SDK directory, there's a ProGuard um, directory in there. So there's a shell script. You just give it uh, your mapping file as a text file, your obfuscated stack trace as a text file, um, and it will spit out your deobfuscated stack trace as text. Um, ProGuard also has a GUI. It's a sweet uh, Java Swing GUI from like the early aughts. Um, and it's got this cool animation that like the letters fly in at the top. So I just, just open that up sometime just, just to watch it. It's pretty cool. Um, but the button, last button on the left there is retrace. It does the same thing. You pick your mapping file, you pick the stack trace, or you paste in the stack trace, and it'll give you the, the deobfuscated version. I'm getting, I've got slides coming up that shows where it fits into the build process. I think, I'm hoping that'll answer. Um, so other, if you're using Crashlytics or some crash reporting tools, they will do this deobfuscation for you. Um, so they will capture a copy of your mapping file at build time. So then when they get a crash, they can automatically deobfuscate it. You don't have to do that by hand. Um, all right, so back into the process of what ProGuard was doing uh, it's done with obfuscation. The next thing it would do is bytecode optimization. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of that. Um, that's the last transformation it's going to do on your code. So then it's going to write out, well, first it's going to write out uh, this dump file. It's a really big text file representation of your Java bytecode that it's finished transforming. Um, it's really, really big. Uh, if you take, I've got a, a sort of a toy app that I use to like try things out with ProGuard. It's about 600 kilobytes compiled. The dump file for it is 18 meg. So just warning, if you've got your CI archiving these files, that one's really big. Don't archive it. Um, and this is actually getting turned off by default in Andro Android Gradle plugin 3.2. So if you do need this, you can add the dash dump flag, give it a file name, and it'll write this out for you, but it's going to be off by default soon. Uh, and then the last thing ProGuard does is write out write out all the transformed bytecode to actual Java bytecode this time um, in, a, in a jar. So 
All right, that was the sort of deep dive into the steps. To back up a step, or sort of just zoom out a little bit, it read in config files, it read in your code. At that point, it figured out where the keep rules matched your code, wrote out seeds. I did the shrinking, wrote out another file with all of the unused code that was removed. Um, it did obfuscation, it wrote out the mapping file, wrote, uh, did some optimizations maybe in there, and then it wrote out the dump file, and then lastly wrote out your uh, bytecode. So those text files that I mentioned, um, those are in the build outputs directory if you ever want to view those. Um, seeds and usage, you might want to use those for, for debugging when you're trying to like solve a ProGuard config issue. Um, mapping, you should keep for any like release build, any build that you're publishing. Um, dump file, don't keep that. Definitely only use that for debugging. Um, so what I want to dig into next is the config rules that you're giving it there, right? right? Because if you give it bad rules, it's garbage in, garbage out. So keep rules look something like this. They look kind of like Java syntax. Um, and I mentioned before, they're, they are describing entry points into your code. So to understand what I mean by entry points, if you've got a Java command line app, right, you start with public static void main. Um, we don't have command line apps, we have Android apps. So we have something like an activity where the framework is going to launch your activity based on an intent. Um, or there's also cases where you're using reflection internally. So ProGuard can't follow that reflection usually. As, if, as long as it's complicated, ProGuard can't follow it. Um, so we have to tell ProGuard, oh, even, this, even though this code doesn't look like it's being used, it is being used. Please don't remove it. Um, that second one there is for methods that are used from the Java native interface, which is another thing that ProGuard can't see unless you tell it about it. Um, yeah, so I mentioned it's kind of like Java syntax, but with, with these asterisks that represent wildcards. And these rules all start with dash keep something. There's several different variants of keep, and they're all a little bit different with how they, how they affect ProGuard's action on your code. So to see the difference, ProGuard for each piece of code needs to figure out, can I remove this if, it's, if it looks like it's not used? And if I don't remove it, if it is used, can I rename it? Um, and it needs to do that both for the class itself and then for each of the um, member variables and methods within that class. Those are the class members. That's the right side of this chart. So if you give it a rule that is dash keep, you're telling ProGuard you cannot remove, you cannot rename. Not for the classes, not for the class members. Um, so an example of this is the at keep annotation. If you put that annotation on the class, the whole class gets kept. Everything inside the class gets kept. Nothing gets renamed. Uh, there's a subtle variation to that, which is keep classes with members. Um, so uh, this applies the same way in that ProGuard can't change anything, but it only applies if the class has the specified members. So in this case, it only applies for classes, right? Class star matches every class, but it only applies to classes that have a method annotated with keep, because that's inside the, the brackets there. Uh, the next one's keep class members. Um, so this one says, as you can see, right? Class can get removed if it's not used. It can get renamed. But these members that are specified, in this case, the creator member, um, it's a field, cannot be removed, even though it looks like it's not being used, and you cannot rename it. Um, so the example here is for the parcelable implementation. The parceler is going to uh, look for this field by reflection at runtime, so it needs it to be there, and it needs to be called creator. Um, keep names says, okay, for any code that matches this, you can still shrink it. If it's not used, fine, get rid of it. But if it is kept, don't change the names. And there's the, a similar variant on this one, same as we saw with keep and keep classes with members, there's keep classes with member names. That only applies if the class has the members that are specified inside the class spec. Uh, the last one is keep class member names. Um, so this is the most, well, it allows ProGuard to do most of its job, but it just says, okay, for the members inside this class, if you've kept them around, if they are used, please don't rename them. Um, so this example is from uh, maybe fields, uh, 
classes that you're using for JSON serialization. Um, so JSON is going to match those up using reflection. So for any of the fields you care about, they need to be named the same thing. Um, if it's not a field that you're referencing from your code, go ahead and remove it, right? We don't need to deserialize that. Um, but anything that's kept around, don't rename it. Uh, the last config switch I'm going to tell you about is add configuration debugging, um, which is um, a little bit of magic because it adds, at build time, it adds some instrumentation into your code so that if a reflection call um, fails or doesn't get the result that it would have expected, it writes this into logcab for you. And so it says, oh, hey, you made this reflection call on a class that I obfuscated. Maybe you want to add a keep rule to keep that class. Um, so if you are debugging a ProGuard issue that you find, um, this might be a very useful thing to turn on. It is new in ProGuard version 6. Um, ProGuard version 6 is used in Android Gradle plugin version 3.2. So if you want to try that out, you need to be on 3.2, or you can actually force a different version of ProGuard. So you can force ProGuard 6 with an older version of the Android Gradle plugin using a, uh, a resolution strategy in your Gradle. Um, only do that in debug builds, though, because that essentially adds the mapping into your, uh, into your code, into your build. Um, so you don't want to ship that, because then if, if somebody has your mapping, they can deobfuscate your app completely. Um, so there's all those config switches. There are others. I'm not going to go into all of them. The ProGuard manual online has full details for everything. Um, but so you put all your, take all those config rules and you put them into a text file. You reference that from your Gradle file using the ProGuard, full, ProGuard files command. Um, and again, you just give this a text file. You can call it multiple times. You can give it multiple files. Um, if you open up a, you know, like a new project in Android Studio, the template is also going to give you this git default ProGuard file. So this is a, a, a config file that ships with the Android Gradle plugin that has rules that are generally applicable to most Android apps. Um, most of the rules that I just showed you were from this default ProGuard file. Uh, things like parcelable and Java native interface, things that generally apply. Um, there are some people that will tell you to use this file as a starting point and pull out of it things that you don't need because there might be, it might be a little bit too broad. Um, so consider doing that. Um, libraries that you're including. If you're including a library that is in AAR, they can ship ProGuard rules in the AAR that Gradle will, uh, the Android Gradle plugin will automatically pick up and include into your um, invocation of ProGuard. So, if you're making a library, this is the, the Gradle function that you use, this consumer ProGuard files. That includes it into your AAR. Um, oh, I wanted to mention, so the, the default ProGuard file, there's two versions of that. One of them has optimizations turned on, and one of them has optimizations turned off. So if you want ProGuard's bytecode optimizations, use ProGuard Android optimize.txt. And the last place that you get uh, config rules from in your app, when you're building your app, is AAPT. So AAPT, um, big diagram, we're gonna go piece by piece. Uh, so ProGuard's in the middle, right? Taking in config and code and turning out uh, transform code. AAPT down here is working on your resources. So AAPT, um, this isn't his primary job. Its primary job is that it's kind of compiling your resource files taking your XML and making a more efficient format. Uh, but while it's processing those, um, it makes some relevant ProGuard rules. So it's looking at your manifest. So it knows any activity that's listed in the manifest can get instantiated by the operating system. So we need to make a rule to keep it around. Or if you're referencing um, custom view subclasses in a layout, if that's the only place you reference it, even if you don't reference that view from anywhere else in your code, we need to keep it because the layout inflator is going to instantiate it by reflection when it's loading that layout. Um, there's a couple other things that it does, on-click methods, anything else in your manifest, services, receivers, all that stuff. Um, it looks like this. It's also in your build folder in intermediates ProGuard rules. Um, I think I went through both of those examples. Yeah, a layout or a, a, 
a custom view and a layout and an activity in your manifest. Um, if you want to take all of the configs that um, ProGuard is loading in from all of these different sources and see all of it together, there's another config switch for that. Uh, you say print configuration and give it a text file. It'll write out everything to that. Um, the other way to track down, so the reason you would want to use either print configuration or, or this next one is if there's a ProGuard rule coming in from somewhere and you don't see why, like why is this thing getting kept? And you want to track down all of the config rules that are getting used by ProGuard. Um, with Gradle, you can pass dash dash debug, and it will print out all of the ProGuard config files that it's loading, so your code, the default one, AAPT, and all the libraries that you're using. Um, and then you can, they're text files, so you can go open those if you need to track something down. Um, you understand this probably. Your code is getting run through the compiler. Libraries that you're shipping also ship class files. We kind of talked about this at the beginning. ProGuard does its transformation, writes out Java bytecode. We don't execute Java bytecode. We execute Dalvik bytecode. So the Dexer has to transform that. It's a bytecode to bytecode transformation. Um, and then that Dalvik bytecode is what finally gets pack packaged into your APK. Um, so this is the build process part that I think answered the question. Um, right. So ProGuard, in the middle here, Android Gradle plugin is doing a lot of other tools as well. This is a small subset of the build process. Um, but about a year ago, Google announced uh, that they had new compiler tools coming out. Um, so D8 and R8. Uh, what are those? DX on the right side there are our DEX code or Java, Java bytecode to Dex code, Dalvik bytecode transformation gets replaced by D8. Um, that came out in Android Gradle plugin 3.0. You could opt into it. Um, it's on by default in, in 3.2. Um, and then um, ProGuard is getting replaced by R8. Uh, well, at least there's this new tool R8 that, is, that can do that job. Um, right, so we just talked about ProGuard for a while, um, and then I'm telling you it's getting replaced. That is okay. The last 20 minutes were not useless. Um, it is, it's just a new tool doing the same job. It's backward compatible. It understands ProGuard's keep rules and all of those other configuration switches. Um, as you can see, it's still, it's in the same spot in the build process. It's doing the same jobs. It's doing, um, you know, it's loading in your config, loading in your code, finding the unused code, remove it. Do, doing obfuscation, doing optimizations. Um, but then it's tightly coupled with this D8 now. Um, so it doesn't actually have to write out Java bytecode and then read that back in to convert it, right? It just sort of hands it right off to D8 to do the bytecode transformation and write out, uh, write out Dalvik at the end. Um, so R8 is open source. Um, being developed pretty, pretty well in the open. You can see all the source code um, at that first link. The second link is their issue tracker. They're very responsive to issues. Um, the last one, there's a Google group um, that last time I checked was actually just commit messages and bug reports. Um, it is available in Android Gradle plugin 3.2. Uh, if you want to try it out, you in your gradle.properties file, you need to do um, Android.enable R8 equals true. That's how you would opt into it. Um, it is a preview. Um, this is my 90s website under construction, GIF. Um, so just know that um, they're not expecting you to be shipping apps to production with this. You probably could, but you might also find bugs in it at this point. Um, and there are a couple of slight differences. Um, so that mapping file, uh, whereas with ProGuard, that included everything, even if that thing wasn't being renamed. With R8, it only prints out the things that it renamed. Um, seeds and usage are not printed by default. You can print them out with those switches. Um, print configuration, I think, does work at this point. It didn't. Several months ago, I actually filed a bug for a couple of those weren't working right. But the, like I said, the team is really responsive to bugs. They fix those really quickly. Um, and they are, they're clearly very committed to uh, to providing a good tool and providing good debugging about the tool as well. 
Um, the dump file, uh, it's gone. I don't think they're going to support this, and that's fine, probably. Um, yeah, it's really big, and I haven't found it useful. Um, like I mentioned, same keep rule format. I've seen some places in the docs that refer to um, different terms. So instead of shrinking, I've seen it called tree shaking in the R8 docs, um, which I guess. Um, and instead of obfuscation, call it minification, because you're taking this long name and making it mini. Um, and I know right now it's sort of a drop-in replacement for ProGuard. Uh, I think the goal, and this is speculation on my part a little bit, but I think since they're making an Android-specific tool, the goal is they can um, do things that ProGuard couldn't, like understand uh, layout files along with your code at the same time, um, and look at your app as a whole and do better optimizations that way. Um, it can also, they're starting to put in smart things about uh, Kotlin-specific optimizations, like merging together uh, lambdas, and you know, because uh, as, as Nate mentioned, sometimes those functions get created as a new class. Um, so it can actually, uh, R8 can combine multiple of those into the same class, which saves you some allocations. Um, yeah, so R8 is definitely early stages now, but it appears it will be the tool at some point going forward. Um, right, so this is your takeaways. Uh, if you haven't tried using ProGuard, turn it on. See if it works. Um, it, the first time you turn it on, it's probably gonna break. Um, so when that happens, take that, uh, that default uh, Android ProGuard rules file, read that. See why would they apply some of these rules? Like what do those mean? Uh, look at the, the rules that AAPT generates for you. So see why that's generating rules for your code. Um, when you go to write keep rules, Keep them narrow and targeted. Uh, this is sort of the, the, the bracket to that slide I showed at the beginning with the bad rules, where it's just lots of stars, like match everything, don't obfuscate this. Um, instead, when you, write, when, go, when you go to write a keep rule, it is because you are trying to solve something that's breaking, right? There is some reflection call that fails. Try to make sure you just, you're just keeping that class, that function, whatever it is that you need to keep, just that thing. Um, basically, keep your wild cards as narrow as possible. Um, and then once you've got ProGuard working in your app, um, try out R8. Flip that switch on, see if that also works. Hopefully it just works out of the box. Um, maybe you'll find some bugs, you can report those, um, get them fixed really quickly while it's still um, a preview tool. Uh, and then that last thing there, that's a, a short link to um, a blog post of mine where I've got links to everything I referenced in here, the ProGuard manual, um, the announcement about D8 and R8, um, the R8 source, um, a lot of those diagrams came from blog posts that I have, um, and those are all there at that link. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>